Wonderful. Thank you. Bomjia Todos. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for listening, those of you who will be uh, in English. Uh, I apologize, my Portuguese is not uh, good enough to deliver a presentation. I'm going to be, I hope, a little bit provocative. I'm really looking forward uh, to the discussion with Marcos uh, in a moment. And last night, we were uh, discussing uh, the way in which it may be that we come at the same agenda uh, from very different angles, but it's going to be interesting to see the degree to which we agree or disagree. How fantastic to see all of the work that has gone into those 18 sectoral uh, reports. And I look forward to having at least um, summaries of those uh, shortly to read. Now what I'm going to do, if it's OK, is talk about the way in which the sustainability agenda is increasingly seen in the rest of the world. Not in Brazil. That's how we will uh, develop the conversation uh, in a moment, uh, when Marcos has done his presentation uh, as well. But my theme today is a question. How do we connect the dots, not just in today's world, but connect tomorrow's dots? That's very much the work that we do with senior business leaders in different parts uh, of the world. And I'm going to draw on some of that work as I go through. But first, I just want to say thank you to CNI for the invitation to be here uh, over these uh, couple of days. I've been a number of times to Brazil. I love the country. People keep asking me uh, this morning, what do you feel about Brazil? And the answer is, I love it. I mean, I genuinely uh, look forward to being here. But I have never been in Brasilia uh, before. So this is a, a very uh, interesting experience uh, for me. And I just wanted to say thank you to Daniela, Priscilla, Sergio, others in the sustainability team at CNI, both for getting me here, whoops, but also uh, for giving me a very useful briefing yesterday on what is happening on the sustainability side of CNI's uh, activities. And one of the things I was particularly interested to hear, many of you probably already know, but the social and the environmental aspects of what CNI are doing in the sustainability space are being brought uh, together. And I think that integration uh, is very exciting. So I don't need to tell you in Brazil uh, that we live in extremely challenging times uh, internationally, politically, economically, increasingly socially uh, as well. And I was briefed before I came here today, I knew it already, but the CNI's membership is very much uh, made up of huge numbers of smaller and medium-sized businesses. My work is not with small and medium-sized businesses. It's mainly with very large, international, big-profile, high-brand uh, companies. But many of those small and medium-sized businesses are in their supply chain. And I'll talk a bit about that. And I was also told, and I, I knew it already, that the political mood uh, within Brazil is quite conservative. Fine. But I'm going to give you something slightly different. And I think the sustainability agenda, which many people understand to be an incremental agenda and largely about being nicer and doing a little bit more good, a little bit more, um, with a little bit more speed, that, whoop, I'm going to move that slightly away. Uh, that agenda is fine, but it's the minimum requirement in the international scene increasingly. And I'm going to talk about a ch uh, an agenda which is much more about uh, radical change. And so two of the most interesting people I've met in my entire life went into space. One of them walked on the moon, Dave Scott, an astronaut. But the other uh, is on our advisory council, has been for 10 years at Volans. And his name is Jerry Linninger. And in the 1980s, he was both an, both an astronaut and a cosmonaut. And he went up into space onto the space station and he spent five months there. And he looked down on the world, including Amazonia, which then was on fire. 
He looked down on the Soviet Union, sorry, before this, the wall went down, and he saw coal-fired power stations with huge areas of soot uh, around them. And he came back absolutely transformed as a man, as a person. And his belief, increasingly, was that water was going to be one of the defining issues of the, then the next century. And he's dedicated his life uh, to that. And as we just heard, droughts and floods in different parts of the world, uh, here in Brazil, elsewhere in Latin America, places like California, in my own country of the United Kingdom, those issues are now increasingly pressing in uh, on us. This is the uh, set of headings I very quickly want to take us through. Some words of introduction, uh, just a little bit about uh, background. Then many of you will know it's 30 years ago that Gro Harlem Brundtland, uh, twice the Norwegian prime minister, produced her report, the Brundtland Commission report, Our Common Future. And we had a session with her uh, earlier this year in Oslo to look back, and I'll just give a few views on that. Then I'm going to do something slightly challenging. I'm going to use uh, the work of a Paris-based but increasingly international group which does supply chain work around the world. It's called Ecovadis. I've been on their advisory board since they were founded about nine, ten years uh, ago. And I'm just going to give a few slides showing how uh, they view uh, your country uh, the issues that you uh, are seen to be uh, tackling or dealing with. Then I'm going to look at the size of the market opportunity. We've already heard this morning from a number of people that this isn't simply about risks and problems. Increasingly, if you get it right, it's about market opportunities uh, as well. So I'll go a little bit into the, uh, the figures there, and then I'm going to look out into the future about where we may be headed uh, next. So just to begin with, uh, a few words of uh, introduction. And the first thing to say, when I travel around the world, the number one question I'm asked everywhere I go, are you an optimist or are you a pessimist? And many of my young colleagues say when they listen to me speak about where climate change is going to hit, take us, we just heard the Secretary of Climate Change or for Climate Change and Forest speak. When I'm asked what do you think about 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees, 4 degrees, 6 degrees? I don't think any of us have any sense of what the impact of a 2 degree warming will be, let alone a 4, a 5, a 6 degree warming. So at one level, I'm pessimistic because I think the science increasingly suggests our problems are going to become dramatically worse. But I'm optimistic in the sense that I think our species uh, you know, Homo sapiens, often does its best work when it's squeezed into a corner. And we've very much squeezed ourselves into a climate corner. And when I come to Brazil, one of the reasons I like here, being here is not simply the friendliness uh, of people and the growing interest in the agenda that, in a way, I represent. But you have some great companies, and I'll mention a couple of them as I go through. But you also have an astonishing concentration across uh, this country of social innovators and social entrepreneurs, extraordinary uh, people, and I love uh, meeting and talking about them. But as I said when I started, most of the work I've done over the years has been with big companies. The painting that you see there is of two people, the two founders of Hewlett-Packard, uh, uh, Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard, and it was just of painting of their garage, or as Americans say, garage, in which they started the company. And I just love that picture of the earth uh, inside uh, as an indication of the sort of challenges that have come up increasingly for top people in business, including uh, people like them. But the reason why the Volkswagen uh, symbol, logo, is there, you all know the story. I'm often asked too, do you trust business. Well, I'm really interested in business. I'm excited about what business leaders are doing in this space. Do I trust business? No, I don't. I've worked with enough companies to see over time how even if they start on the journey towards sustainability, they often back off. I've worked with companies like Shell, for example, uh, that have done that, but are now coming back again uh, under a different uh, management team. So I don't particularly trust uh, business. And then examples like the Volkswagen 
uh, example, I show, sh show how deep uh, some of the criminality or legal activities can sometimes uh, take us. So that's just a public health warning. Business sometimes makes mistakes, and it sometimes does those accidentally, and it sometimes does them quite consciously. And I think it's very clear with VW, uh, increasingly, uh, that they did a lot of what they've done uh, consciously. Now, one of the things I'm also asked to say something about is the business case for sustainability, the business case for social change. And we've spent 15, 20 years working on that. I love that side of our work, but I think the time of just focusing on the business case is disappearing. And I think increasingly we have to talk about business models, how value is created in new ways. Uh, and I was in New York uh, two weeks ago for the UN Private Sector Forum, the Global Compact Leaders Summit, and, and for Climate Week. And one of the companies we were uh, with there was Fibria, and they were talking about the work that they're doing in the forestry sector with five different business models, uh, novel business models. And I think increasingly, that's the direction in which this agenda has to go. Now, I know Nestle has been in the news uh, in Brazil in recent uh, times because of the obesity uh, issue. I declare an interest. I, for seven or eight years now, I've been on, a, been on an advisory board uh, within Nestle. And in fact, I was in the boardroom when this campaign broke. You may have seen it where, where um, uh, orangutan or, or monkey fingers were bitten off and a lot of blood. Very effective campaign. And when that came in on the screens in the Nestle boardroom, there was some degree uh, of shock. So I'll say a, a little bit more in a moment about why activists, campaigners, NGOs continue to be enormously important. They're not always right. They're not always going to win. But in terms of pushing the wider uh, social and environmental agenda, they remain immensely important. And businesses that fail to engage NGOs effectively in good time uh, can suffer. Now, one of the people who came to a round table that we did in New York was the editor-in-chief of the Harvard Business Review, Adi Ignatius. Some of you will have seen, those of you who read the Harvard Business Review, a growing number of articles on sustainable business on this agenda. And what was interesting in 2015 is that they did a survey of the most effective, the most important, the uh, uh, greatest leaders, in a way, um, across business internationally. And that year, for the first time, they changed the way they measured uh, the rankings. And they gave 20% of the rankings for social and environmental uh, factors. And many of you will remember what happened. Jeff Bezos of Amazon, who'd been right at the top, went down to number 87. I was quite pleased to see that. Uh, I sometimes buy things from Amazon, but I think they have uh, some consequences in the wider world. And Lars Rabian Sorensen, who was the CEO of a healthcare company in Denmark, Nova Nordisk, rocketed right up to the top. And the cover is showing his face covered because nobody knew who he was. Uh, so it was an indication of two things. One is that when you change the metrics, you get different results in terms of who really is a good leader uh, in our world. But the second thing is that within a few months, Lars Rabin, uh, it, announced, it, was, it was announced that he was leaving the company because their financial results were not good enough. So it's not just financial or social or environmental. You've got to be able to do all of these ele elements in an integrated way. And I think one of the most exciting things about Nova Nordisk is that they are thinking about the future in an integrated way. At the bottom there, you will see a label saying cities changing diabetes. Nova Nordisk makes insulin. If you or members of your family have diabetes, you thank God or you thank companies like Nova Nordisk for insulin. You look at the future, and I mentioned obesity and, and, and the campaign against Nestle. Obesity brings a high body mass index, brings diseases, chronic diseases, including uh, diabetes. And so what Novo Nordisk have done, they could look out at the future and think, that's a gold mine. 
we will make a huge amount of money for, from selling ever more diabetes in this world. And what they've done instead is to say, that's a real problem for public health care systems and governments and different parts of the world. The cost of treating diabetics as their numbers grow could collapse um, public health care systems. So we've got to act. How do we work with mayors, city administrations, to increase understanding of this uh, growing risk and ensure people eat in the right way, exercise in the right way, and so on? A couple of very quick thoughts on the 30th anniversary of uh, the Brundtland Commission report, Our Common Future. As I said, we got Grohal and Brundtland uh, now retired uh, into a meeting in Oslo early this year with a lot of young people uh, from Scandinavia. And we challenged, we asked the question, given what we were trying to do 30 years ago, how much progress uh, have we been making? And many of the young people were quite pessimistic. They think on things like climate change, we are really going backwards in some ways. But overall, I think the consensus was a great deal of progress has been, has been made, but only just getting started. And in terms of the progress, this is a photograph of our company that I co-founded uh, 30 years ago, sustainability. At that time, sustainability as a word did not even appear in the Brundtland Commission report. We got letters using all sorts of different spellings, very few of them uh, the right ones. But very quickly, uh, what we then over time called the triple bottom line, agenda, economic, social, environmental, it's been mentioned already today, people, planet, profit. Uh, it was picked up by the Global Reporting Initiative. I was one of the funders uh, and on the board for a number of years. The International Integrated Reporting Council that's starting to try and bring all of that together. The Dow Jones Sustainability Index is again on a triple bottom line uh, model. Fantastic. But many of you will have seen what happened when uh, VW was exposed uh, for what it had been doing. Dow Jones, the, the sustainable uh, sustainability indexes, about two weeks previously, had put Volkswagen right at the top of their sector. Are we measuring the right things, and are we measuring the right things in the right uh, way, I think is the question that's asked. And one of the most exciting um, initiatives around the world now is the B Corporation movement, Sistema B uh, in, in um, Latin America. And that, as many of you will know, has attracted several thousand companies, including Natura and this country, to start thinking about how do you charter your uh, company around uh, the triple bottom line. So I find that uh, quite optimistic. Now, you may struggle a little bit uh, to read these two diagrams I'm going to put up, but I'll, I'll, I'll explain uh, what they say. Every year, uh, Globescan in Canada and sustainability organization I've already mentioned do surveys of experts around the world, thousands of them. And this one just shows the question, uh, the responses to questions around um, who's driving the sustainability agenda. And what you see at the top over time is changes. You see NGOs sometimes, sometimes social entrepreneurs, I've mentioned them as well. Um, but other actors, uh, like the private sector, quite some way down. And people like cities also quite some way down. And the second um, image, if I can get that one up, uh, asks a different question. It's who do you expect to really drive change in what comes next? Quite interesting. Despite the national governments having been so low, they're seen right at the top. But interestingly too, uh, alongside national governments, you have the private sector and business. And everything that I'll say from this point on is in that context. At a time when national governments are not properly playing the role that they should be playing, business is increasingly uh, having to step up uh, to the challenge. And it doesn't matter where you look in the world, what the issue is. Governments are struggling to deal with issues like uh, plastics uh, in the ocean. And forgive me the uh, rather dramatic image of the robot, but there's a reason for putting it there. And the number 10, uh, the, what, what this is, is a recent survey looking at what the key issues are in the sustainability agenda uh, for uh, business. And at the bottom, you see a jobless future brought in by 
things like uh, the greater use of robotics over time. But if you just run down the list and you look at what's on it, you see globalization, which we've got used to over the last 20, 30 years, increasingly under pressure. Where's that one going to go? You see cybercrime, uh, increasing hacking attacks, some of them uh, perhaps most notoriously led by uh, uh, President Putin's uh, Russia, but there are many other sources of these uh, attacks. You see a, a change in climate leadership. You see city mayors increasingly stepping up because their cities and their economies increasingly at uh, risk. We've heard about the global goals, the sustainable development goals. Great launch, but what's going to happen to them over time? And I'll very briefly touch on that in a moment. False news, false facts. Uh, they're all about us. I had a conversation earlier on today which just reminded me of how, me how much false information is now being broadcast and disseminated by very ordinary people without totally understanding what they're doing. Agriculture and food, big issue. Uh, soy and various other things for this country. Financial disclosures, um, health care issues, particularly the risk of pandemics, uh, consumption driving all of this, uh, and so on. So that's just an indication that the agenda that we're talking about here today is not just you know, labor conditions, it's not just human rights, it's not just uh, tropical deforestation or whatever. It's increasingly a systemic agenda, which business is increasingly going to struggle to deliver on its own. And it's all within the context of a set of economic pressure waves that have developed over the last 100, 150 years. Some of you will have read a very good short book by the World Economic Forum called The Fourth Industrial Revolution. Great book. But if you focus a little bit more on the data, you don't see four revol revolutions, you see six. And these are just some of those, the dark blue line are some of those uh, ups uh, and downs. And what's really interesting is that the whole sustainable development, the whole sustainable business agenda has grown up in the most recent of those waves, the fifth. And that's largely been driven by information technology. Uh, and that brings some issues. And I'll touch very briefly as I conclude in a moment on what those issues are. But I was born in 1949. These diagrams show the period since 1950, one year uh, later. And what they show is a series of exponential trends in our economies, in our societies, and critically uh, in our environment. And they show things like population, urban populations, gross domestic product, they're all going um, exponential. Well, in a way, you might see that as good news. And then you see these sorts of diagrams showing at the same time species loss, soils loss, uh, uh, carbon in the atmosphere, ocean acidification, also going uh, exponential. So when I started saying the sustainability agenda now is not an incremental change agenda, not a citizenship agenda as such, that's the background uh, for what uh, I was saying. And you've all seen these sorts of diagrams. But this, interestingly, goes back 400,000 years. Just look at the scale of the change that is coming upon us. And those changes will have uh, consequences. Now, in my own city of London, I live uh, there, we've just, some of you will have seen a terrible uh, story, um, uh, unbelievable in a way, with almost 100 people burned to death in a tower block. Why did that happen? Stupidity, all sorts of things. But one of the key reasons people had put insulation blocks on the outside uh, of that tower to save energy. What we do, and the intelligence with which we do it, and the effectiveness and efficiency and so on, is going to have very real consequences for all of us, but particularly for the poor over time. And the image of the icebreaker, you all know the story, but ships can now pass through the North Pole area without being stopped by the ice. Who would have imagined 20 or 30 years ago that we would have got uh, to that point in all of this? More locally, uh, the combination of warming climate, uh, standing water from storms, uh, spread of insects, we're starting to see other uh, issues on the public health care um, front uh, coming up. Now, let me just very quickly go through Ecovadis uh, and their thinking on your country 
and what they see as the issues around uh, supply chains reaching into uh, Brazil. And what you'll see here, and it's, it's, it's slightly difficult uh, to read, but the, the number of companies that, that they're serving here is about 40,000. So it's a big, big number around the world. And there are, these are not primarily big companies. Most of them are small and medium-sized uh, enterprises. So this is the whole world, and what you see is a reasonably balanced uh, bell jar distribution there. You then come to Brazil, and what you see is rather different. It's skewed. Now, you'd expect that. Well, firstly, the, the numbers here are smaller, about 12, uh, 1,300 uh, companies uh, being surveyed. But again, you, what you see is more problems. Um, and and the, the, the gradation is just showing uh, on, on the right-hand side um, the, the difference between those people who are doing nothing and people who are doing a very great deal. So what are the issues that a, an organization like Ecovadis uh, is now focusing on? I won't read all of these, but you know corruption. It's fantastic that this country is increasingly dealing with bribery and corruption. There is no single more important issue than that. If you cannot trust people to manage money and society's resources, you will not get to sustainable development as the, the uh, sustainable development uh, uh, call for. Not easy. My own country of Britain was the most corrupt country in the world, bar none, in the 1700s and 1800s. But various people fought that back. You're doing the same. Uh, good luck uh, with that. Then in the sustainability world, uh, more, more, more um, closely defined, people often think about Amazonia. And Brazilians tell me Amazonia is a very long way away, uh, I know, and, and, and it's, it's a, another bunch of people. Um, that's how still people think about uh, Brazil. And, and at the moment, the picture in the wider world is that the deforestation problem uh, is getting worse, the problem that uh, Jerry Linegar looked down on in the 1980s. And positives. Well, it's great that there are half a dozen, six companies in the uh, Dow Jones sustainability uh, indices. It's great to see them there. Renewable energy, a very big plus uh, in this country, uh, clearly. And then, uh, you know, UNDP sort of picking up on uh, relations with um, indigenous uh, communities. Sometimes good story, sometimes a less uh, good story. And then you ask, the analysts with Ecovadis, and they brief very large companies primarily on where to locate their supply chains, and the, they brief them on the sort of risks, uh, challenges, opportunities to look out for. What you see is things like child labor still. You see uh, a bunch of other uh, issues there on the right. What typically happens is Brazil tends to sit in the middle of all of these rankings, and it may well be that you're quite happy uh, with that position, you feel that you've got lots of other uh, priorities. And there are a plenty of um, opportunities out there, female participation on the labor market at the bottom there. So, you know, great news. But be aware that these sorts of rankings increasingly also have consequences. Big companies pay a growing amount of attention to not only the country level analysis, but also the sector level analysis. And I think the 18 reports that we just saw launched may help to um, address that. So that's, that's the nature of a challenge. A lot of what's happening in the space is no longer done in the streets with big signs by campaigners. A lot of what is happening is starting to happen in quiet rooms with computers. I must get better at dealing with this. Um, with analysts who are you know, very, they're often they're introverted people. They're putting together data in new ways and I think uh, it would be good to pay more attention to that. So, quick few slides on the size of the market opportunity, which is now out there. Again, already been uh, referenced by other uh, speakers. Uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, extraordinary uh, initiative. They've g g gathered a certain amount of support from uh, leading companies around the world. Many companies you, doing a tick box thing. Do we, you know, where do we fit? What, where does what we're already doing? fit into this complicated 17-goal uh, framework. But we're working with the Global Compact. We're working with the executive director of the Global Compact. So it's 9,000 plus companies uh, around the world are members uh, of the Global Compact. And what we're doing is trying to look into a very different future 
and my final few slides are about that very different uh, future. And we're also working with a group called the Business uh, for Sustainable Development Commission. And what you have on the left hand side there of the screen is a very, very interesting study that they did uh, 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 which looks at a number of different sectors and nexuses of economic activity and identifies by 2030 market opportunities worth at least 12 trillion US dollars uh, a year. On certain assumptions, the numbers could be two to three times higher. At the same time, we've done very recently also for the Business and Sustainable Development Commission a report on business models, looking at where in the world you start to see some companies, some entrepreneurs, some investors building new forms of value creation. Uh, that's downloadable, both of those reports downloadable uh, from the web. Final few slides, just in terms of where we think we're headed and why we do not think that the incremental sustainability agenda is going to be enough. For us, this started five years ago. We did a big conference called the Breakthrough Capitalism Forum uh, in London, funded uh, in some part by Generation. They're the very successful investment fund set up by Al Gore and David Blood. And since then, we've worked with a range of partners, including, for example, Arm Holdings, who design many of the, or in fact, most of the chips that are used in, in, in critical functions in our economy. And the key part of the content is filmed interviews. And I'm just going to give you a very quick one-minute uh, video in a second. Filmed interviews with some of the most interesting innovators, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs in different parts of the world who are developing these uh, breakthrough business models. And in doing that, we're working with some quite interesting uh, partners, UBS, the Swiss bank, Arabesque. Uh, it's an artificial intelligence-driven uh, investment fund. And I'll, uh, the final few slides have one slide on them. This is how we think about the future, and this is why we do not think incrementalism uh, is enough to see us uh, into a sustainable future. And I'm not going to go through this in any detail, but what you will, may see, horizontal axis goes from negative to positive impact. So when I started work, I was doing environmental impact assessments, looking at the negative consequences of what business was doing. People increasingly are now looking at the social positive impact. And you actually have two brothers who define either end of that axis. They're the Page brothers. Larry Page co-founded uh, Google, and he talks about new technologies, new business models that could create uh, benefits for a billion people. His brother, Carl, uh, is part of the Anthropocene Institute and is looking at problems, pandemics, nuclear exchanges uh, that could kill or damage the interests of a billion people. The vertical axis is where things go very strange. That goes, that's, that's orders of magnitude. So it starts to the halfway point is just one order of magnitude. And then it goes tenfold, a hundredfold, and so on. And this is the area that Silicon Valley has become really clever uh, at operating in. And we talk about business as usual, change as usual, and then in the breakthrough zone, you have things that are driving us towards exponential disaster and things that are um, potentially, at least, driving us towards exponential uh, success. And if you haven't read Paul Hawkins' new book called Drawdown, I recommend it incredibly highly. He has done math mathematical modeling over several years of over a hundred different solutions to climate change. And then he's ranked them, and he's got some very, very interesting numbers against them and case studies. Very readable book, very, very highly uh, recommended. I'll skip this uh, element and just go on to this one. So these are, these are genuinely the final few uh, slides. I'm going to try and look into the future. Where are we headed in all of this? Where is sustainability as an agenda taking us? And I'm going to do it sort of largely in uh, shorthand. So I think the solar challenger that flew around the world on solar power uh, uh, 18 months ago or so is as important as Lindbergh's um, The Spirit of St. Louis that flew across the Atlantic about 70 years ago. And the reason is both of them demonstrated an emerging power source. So uh, gasoline, fuel, aviation fuel, 
in the case of Lindbergh, renewable energy in this case. And I said earlier on that we're coming out of a fifth wave and into a sixth one. Well, that sounds exciting, and new technologies are always exciting. But we're just heading into a period of 12 to 15 years, and you see it goes into the zone of maximum uncertain uncertainty and confusion. I think we're headed into a period where what we see happening in the United States with Donald Trump, what we see happening in Europe with Brexit and with the result of the German elections, you see much more of that in different parts uh, of the world. So that's the bad news. Let me just see if we can project this one minute video. Trouble with pessimism and the trouble with despair that comes out of it is that as a response, not only is it useless, it's also no fun. Failure is meant to be not the opposite of success. It's meant to define the true parameters of what real success could look like. I feel very fortunate that I've got this front row seat to watch the next industrial revolution unfold in front of us. I'm not making this up. How can we reimagine the way we deliver value or fulfill a fundamental human need? There is a tsunami of change coming. The poorest child on the planet with a cell phone has access to as much information as the CEO of Google. Just complete evening of the playing field. The infrastructure we build over the next four years will determine the fate of humanity. You can throw your life into solving a problem through business. And uh, then you make big change. So those people are all uh, among the uh, 50 or 60 change agents, many of them CEOs, and the last one was Patrick Thomas of Covestra, used to be biomaterial science, that we've interviewed for the Global Compact, and the content is on a website called projectbreakthrough.io. So that's all exciting. We're enormously energetically pushing that out into the wider world. But, again, uh, if you think about the new technologies that are coming at us, many of them have consequences that we haven't yet properly thought through. And last night at dinner, I was mentioning somebody, Thomas Midgley. Some of you might have heard of him, but he was a long time ago. Most people I talk to in the United States uh, don't remember him. He worked for General Motors, and then he worked for DuPont. And he came up with a hundred things that got patents. So he's a very brilliant man. But I just remember three things that Thomas Midgley Jr. did. He came up with leaded gasoline, which was a brilliant energy efficiency uh, breakthrough innovation at the time. And yet, as we know, around the world, it massively poisoned young people's nervous systems, affected their learning ability. The second technology that he came up with, again, brilliant at the time in terms of safety, was uh, a family of uh, chemicals called freons, chlorofluorocarbons. And they blew a hole in the stratospheric ozone layer. So thank you, Tom Midgley. That's um, not quite what you expected. Probably no reason you, <laughs> that you would have thought that that would be the consequence. But that's what happened. And then third, very sadly, towards the end of his life, he contracted polio and he built a bed. And the bed was like a robotic bed. This was the 1940s and it would get him in and out of bed without nursing help, and it strangled him. And I simply tell those stories to say, however clever we are, the technologies and the business models we're in process of developing could have quite unforeseen consequences. So with the Global Compact, one of the things we're doing, and with a group called PA Consulting, we're looking at many of these different emerging technologies and trying to engage the people who are developing them. And one of the things we find is when we, when we go to see them in places like California, uh, they say, very interesting to see you. Nobody else from the sustainability movement has yet come to talk, us, talk to us about all this. And I think one of the things we've got to do is get out more and engage these people uh, much more effectively than we have. And yet already, I mentioned Arabesque. They're London-based. They're a, an investment fund. Uh, and they do screening of companies. So far. 4,000 companies around the world are on their database, and they're using machine learning and artificial intelligence to track companies. Now, this is no longer just NGOs tracking um, 
uh, what companies do. It's, it's, it's these sort of robotic intelligences that are uh, dragging information from wherever they can find it, including, hopefully, uh, those 18 reports. Oh, I should just go back and just uh, read the quote, because I think it's quite important. Uh, what they're saying, uh, this is their CEO, the environmental, social, and governance agenda is the same for finance as e electricity is to the auto industry. You think about auto design, you'll probably think about, well, we've got lights, and we've got ignition, and we've got you know, starters, and so on. But then you think about uh, uh, electric mobility, electric vehicles, and so on, and autonomous uh, vehicles. That's their uh, theory uh, of change, and I think it's well worth thinking about. Now, just a quick fire, two double slide set, just looking at one area. You look around the city uh, of Brasilia, you see more cars than I would see you know, in, in, in an hour than you'd see, I'd see in a normal uh, week. Where's that going to take us? Well, this is a study that was done by a group called Rethink X, and it looks at transportation just in the 10 years from 2020 to 2030 and worldwide. When companies like General Motors, when Ford, Toyota see these predictions, they go white. They go into shock. I was talking to somebody from General Motors just um, a couple of weeks ago, and he said we're going to see more change in the automotive industry in five years than we've seen in the last 50. That's the scale of the disruption that people are increasingly expecting. And what this um, diagram shows, it goes to 2030, and it shows two things. One is we will all travel more. So there will be a 50%, they reckon, uh, increase in passenger kilometers or passenger miles traveled. Well, that's great news if you're making, designing, selling uh, cars. The problem is the second bullet point, which basically makes the point that over the same time scale, we will see a 70% collapse in the revenues uh, that can be earned in this sector. So if you're an automotive company, you're an oil company, this looks like an existential threat uh, increasingly. So I, in, in sector after sector, each of those 18 sectors that you lined up here just now, digitalization and sustainability put together are going to disrupt their business models quite fundamentally, and it's going to happen far faster uh, than most of us uh, might uh, imagine. And this, many of you will have seen this diagram, but I just think it's, it's, it's a very interesting way of mapping uh, how these exponential trajectories uh, work in our minds and also in the wider uh, economy. For a long time, nothing seems to happen. And then suddenly, you get to the point where there is breakthrough. Again, I'm sounding like a talking library, but if you have not read this book, Exponential Organizations, by several people from Singularity University, extremely highly uh, recommended. And you see this sort of battle playing out. We, in, in London, the uh, authorities have just banned Uber. You know, everywhere I travel in Brazil, I see Uber advertised. In a couple of weeks, it won't be allowed in London at all. And the reason is because there is a concern about the social performance of the uh, company. So all of these people who are thinking about exponentials, uh, they think it'll just happen. And what we're going to see increasingly, I think, is these tensions between social, environmental, governance factors and those exponentials. This, I mentioned the Generation uh, Impact uh, Investment Management Fund earlier on. They have a foundation. This report came out, and I just want to read these two paragraphs. I never read slides, but just to give you time to digest what they're saying, uh, these are the two paragraphs. They say the sustainability revolution appears to have the scale of the industrial revolution and the agricultural revolution and the speed of the information revolution. Compared to these three previous revolutions, the sustainability revolution is likely to be the most significant event in economic history. Now, it takes a while just to think through what that means, but when we're talking about sustainability and we're meaning a bit of reporting and a bit of stakeholder engagement and a bit of supply chain management, we're not properly addressing uh, this uh, agenda. So this is my last slide, and I'm just going to give you two ideas. You may have your own. Two ideas of what you might want to do next. Whatever your business, whatever your sector, wherever your markets are, you might want to try putting your th company through 
the B Corporation, the B Lab pro um, assessment uh, process. You don't have to join, you don't have to pay anything, you can just download the, uh, the, the assessment uh, tool from the uh, internet and the uh, link is given there. That's one thing, and, and both of the companies I'm still involved in, Sustainability and Valance Ventures, are now B Corporations, because we think it's useful and it works. And the second idea, about a, uh, two weeks ago in New York, we launched what we call the breakthrough pitch. So people kept saying to us as we traveled around the world, it's great to have these Elon Musks and people like that talking to us about this you know, exponential change. How do we pitch this? How do we present this to our own top team, to our board and our C-suite? So we actually just tried to distill into a slide deck uh, with accompanying uh, a guide how we think this agenda that I've just been going through is best sold uh, to um, top teams. So again, if there's interest, do uh, download it. And one of the things we must do is translate it into Portuguese. So that's it from me. If you want to chase later on, that's my email address. I, I answer all emails, and that's my Twitter address. So I think I'm going to step down from the stage now and let Marcus come up and say what he has to say. And then I really look forward to the discussion uh, that follows. Thanks very much indeed for your attention. Muito bom dia, Dr. Schellen, Dr. Marcos Guerra, na figura de quem eu cumprimento todos os presentes. É uma honra compartilhar esse painel com o John. Parabéns, John, pela extraordinária apresentação. Parabéns à equipe da CENI por mais essa edição importante do CNI Sustentabilidade. A primeira vez que eu tive em Brasília foi em 91, né? e eu me lembro que quando eu cheguei no aeroporto, né, havia um grupo muito grande de gente com uma série de faixas, faixas que diziam o seguinte, bem-vindos a Brasília, sede do Congresso Internacional de Estudos sobre Objetos Voadores Não Identificados. UFOs, OVNIs. E aí, um pouco para começar essa conversa sobre sustentabilidade, o que ela significa hoje, vai continuar significando para os próximos anos, eu fiquei pensando o seguinte, vamos supor né, que aqui do lado de fora da, da CNI, onde existe um terreno vazio, de repente, meus amigos, pousasse uma espaçonave de um outro sistema sideral, né, e de repente saísse dessa espaçonave, um, um visitante né, desse outro planeta, ele vai entrar aqui nesse auditório e ele vai nos perguntar o seguinte, é, pessoal, quais são as três coisas mais importantes acontecendo no mundo hoje, né, nesse planeta de vocês? Quais são as três coisas mais importantes que estão acontecendo no dia 5 de outubro de 2017? O que, que vocês diriam? Vamos ver algumas contribuições aqui. Três coisas. A gente pode escolher três coisas muito importantes que estão acontecendo no mundo hoje. Quais elas são? Ou deixaríamos o nosso visitante sem resposta? Desigualdade. Desigualdade. É uma, é um nacionalismo. nacionalismo. Vamos a outra. Tem uma dinâmica de desigualdade, né? as distâncias estão crescendo, sociais e econômicas. Há uma ideia aqui sobre nacionalismo que estão exacerbados. Outra resposta, três, são três coisas mais importantes que estão acontecendo no mundo neste momento. Individualidade ou individualismo, uma espécie de, digamos assim, um afloramento não é, do, 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 da ideia de individualismo. Mudanças climáticas. Estão, estão puxando aqui já mais para a nossa temática. Uh, outras contribuições, o que mais que está acontecendo no mundo de tão importante hoje? Intolerância, que tem muito que ver com o individualismo também e com essa emergência. Emergência de uma guerra, provavelmente com o um epicentro. Oi? Iminência de uma guerra, com, uma, com, com um provável epicentro, digamos, ali na Coreia do Norte, na Península Coreana. Novos mercados. Você olha para, para a Índia, por exemplo, que está crescendo 7,5% ao ano, né? muito provavelmente nos próximos anos será, juntamente com a China, não é o, o grande motor da economia eh, mundial, digitalização, esse fenômeno que foi descrito aqui muito bem também 
na palestra do John, se eu tivesse que dar uma resumida na contribuição de vocês, eu diria que há três dinâmicas muito importantes acontecendo no mundo hoje. As três representam desafios muito importantes. O primeiro, que tem que ver com sua resposta, é o que eu chamaria de o desafio da desglobalização. Por que o desafio da desglobalização? Porque nós nos acostumamos a um paradigma né, que talvez tenha sido inaugurado com a queda do Muro de Berlim e com o desmantelamento da União Soviética, de que uh, o livre mercado, o livre comércio, o Estado de Direito, a democracia representativa, eram quase que pilares intocáveis né, da maneira pela qual os povos buscariam é, prosperidade com sustentabilidade. E, no entanto, quando a gente olha alguns dos uh, fenômenos econômicos mais impressionantes dessas últimas décadas, vamos pensar, por exemplo, no caso da China, né? a China que, em 1978, por exemplo, com uma população que era dez vezes maior do que o Brasil, tinha um, um PIB per capita dez vezes menor do que o Brasil, né? e hoje, como vocês sabem, ela já é uma economia de 12 trilhões de dólares, com um PIB per capita superior ao nosso, ela atingiu esse que talvez seja o maior milagre econômico da história da humanidade, desde que José interpretou os sonhos do faraó, né? sem agências reguladoras, sem clara divisão entre os poderes, sem democracia representativa, sem Estado de Direito, tal qual nós o entendemos no Ocidente, e, em grande medida, desrespeitando o meio ambiente, desrespeitando aquilo que nós chamamos de sustentabilidade. Absoluto desrespeito a leis de propriedade intelectual, e, ainda assim, ela deixou de ser, como mencionei, uma economia absolutamente marginal para ser alçada ao topo daquilo que hoje a gente chama no mundo de G2, o né, um grupo das duas, dos dois países mais importantes. O segundo desafio, que é o desafio de sustentabilidade, né, eu acho que é, um, que é um desafio que todos nós aqui reconhecemos pelas questões climáticas, pelo, pelas questões do meio ambiente urbano, pelo aquecimento terrestre, sem dúvida alguma, é um desses pontos que chamaria a atenção do visitante desse outro planeta. Mas há também uma terceira dinâmica, há também uma, um terceiro uh, expoente desse mundo que nós estamos vivendo hoje, que tem respondido por diferentes nomes. Né? Por exemplo, o Klaus Schwab, fundador do Fórum Econômico Mundial, mencionado aqui pelo John, chama esse fenômeno de quarta revolução industrial. Né? Na Alemanha, numa parte importante né, da rede em que vocês é, industrialistas, que pensam a indústria, a política industrial, chamam esse fenômeno de indústria 4.0. Outros chamam esse período de a era da adaptação. Outros ainda chamam esse período também de uma fase, esse, esse também é uma, uma contribuição do Klaus Schwab, de talentismo, doutor Scheller, porque... É, se nos modelos, nos modelos econômicos tradicionais a gente convencionou trabalhar com três fatores de produção, né, o, o trabalho, o capital e a terra, talvez agora nós estamos falando de um outro modelo, de um outro mundo em que o talento seja um quarto fator mais importante do que os três precedentes. De modo que, para descrever esse momento que nós vivemos na economia global, não faz mais sentido falar sobre capitalismo, mas vale a pena falar sobre talentismo. Então, mais uma vez, três coisas mais importantes acontecendo no mundo hoje, desglobalização, sustentabilidade e quarta revolução industrial, ou talentismo. Agora, se o nosso visitante do outro planeta desse uma olhada rápida, fizesse uma, uma análise minimamente microscópica entre esses três pilares, a minha impressão, John, é que ele olharia, olharia para o segundo e para o terceiro e nos perguntaria o seguinte, bom, mas eles não são a mesma coisa? Sustentabilidade e a nova era do talento, sustentabilidade e indústria 4.0 não são a mesma coisa? Então eu queria propor aos senhores a seguinte perspectiva. O conceito de sustentabilidade é um conceito orgânico, orgânico, 
isso teve muito presente aqui no John, entre outras maneiras, sobre a forma dele meio que decretar é, um fim dos efeitos multiplicadores positivos do que ele chamou de sustentabilidade incremental. E por que, que isso está acontecendo? E aqui eu, eu vou ser um pouco óbvio. É porque se você pensar nas duas fontes de alimentação desse conceito orgânico, que é o conceito de sustentabilidade, vocês vão perceber que eles têm um duto de alimentação originado de fontes mais ecológicas e ele tem um outro duto de alimentação oriundo de, de fontes mais econômicas. É óbvio a relação umbilical que existe entre ecologia e economia, como, aliás, os próprios gregos nos ensinaram. Mas eu queria argumentar com vocês que talvez nesses últimos 45 anos, né, desde que essa dinâmica entrou de uma maneira mais definitiva na agenda internacional, sobretudo na agenda dos países e mais tarde na agenda das empresas, né, com a conferência de Estocolmo de 72, minha impressão é que, do ponto de vista conceitual e da construção de parâmetros, desses dois dutos que alimentam a noção de sustentabilidade, nós tivemos um fluxo mais intenso e caudaloso no duto ecológico e menos no duto econômico. É como se nós tivéssemos avançado de uma maneira muito mais sofisticada a nossa discussão sobre os aspectos ecológicos e nós tivéssemos avançado menos nas características econômicas. Vejam, por exemplo, apenas a avaliação do duto ecológico que sustenta o conceito de sustentabilidade. Né? Nós saímos, nos anos 70, daquilo que poderia ser entendido o debate ecológico quase como uma questão de preservação, de intocabilidade, de museificação dos recursos naturais, uma espécie de jogo de soma zero entre natureza e homem, que talvez fosse até uma reação compreensível a esse período, né, que vai do, da metade uh, do século passado, né, fim da Segunda Guerra Mundial, até o começo dos anos 70, que é um período de dramática industrialização, não apenas de Estados Unidos e Europa, mas também de uma parte importante do chamado terceiro mundo, do mundo em desenvolvimento. Né, com, digamos assim, legados ambientais absolutamente periculosos. Essa questão da preservação ela foi evoluindo ao longo do tempo para a questão de utilização inteligente. Nós não somos inimigos do, do, do meio ambiente, e o meio ambiente tampouco deve ditar exclusivamente o nosso, a nosso, o nosso comportamento econômico. Precisamos utilizá-los inteligentemente. Nós precisamos trabalhar com a ideia de renovabilidade, nós precisamos tra trabalhar com ideias, como hoje aparecem, de economia circular, fazendo crescentemente que a dinâmica saia né, dos grandes tratados internacionais para o próprio planejamento cotidiano das empresas. Né? Hoje se fala muito dessa transição, ontem à noite, Percy si conversava conosco, né, da esfera da responsabilidade socioambiental, por uma outra visão que faz com que a preocupação ambiental seja considerada um item cotidiano das corporações. Nós avançamos muito aqui. Agora, do ponto de vista econômico, mais uma vez, desse duto econômico que também alimenta esse conceito orgânico, que é o conceito de sustentabilidade, a minha impressão, doutor Scheller, é que nós estamos entrando numa nova fase, que vai determinar, em grande medida, quão sustentável é o conceito de sustentabilidade. Por exemplo, o John utilizou uma frase, talvez de uma maneira não percebida pela maioria de vocês na apresentação dele, que é uma, é uma frase, a meu ver, absolutamente aterrorizadora, que é a ideia de jobless future. Nós estamos falando de uma situação não apenas de jobless future, mas talvez de businessless future dada a dramaticidade dessas mudanças que estão acontecendo. E eu vou voltar, então, portanto, a essa temática do talento como pilar da sustentabilidade para ver se a gente consegue deixar esse quadro mais claro. Né? Por exemplo, se nós, de fato, do ponto de vista econômico, 
estamos entrando numa nova era do talento, em que o insumo de produção mais importante é o talento, a gente precisa se perguntar o que, que é isso. E aqui nós já vamos perceber uma metamorfose muito interessante. Por quê? Do ponto de vista pessoal, individual, talento sempre foi enxergado como um sinônimo de vocação. Não é isso? Aquela lindíssima palavra em latim, vocação, vox, né? uma voz que você ouve dentro de você e te empurra para uma determinada é, direção na vida. É como se houvesse, por exemplo, aqui três ou quatro meninos brigando na frente do palco e aí um quinto menino se aproxima e por meio da sua capacidade de lidar com os outros, os, as crianças deixam de brigar para brincar. E aí você diz o seguinte, puxa, como essa quinta criança tem talento para lidar com os outros quatro. Ou seja, do ponto de vista individual, vocação sempre foi muito, talento sempre foi muito voltado à ideia de vocação. Do ponto de vista das empresas, do ponto de vista das empresas, a maneira pela qual os livros de administração nos ensinaram o que significa talento, era quase como um sinônimo dessa expressão core business, que também é uma expressão linda, né? core vem do latim core, né? o coração, a centralidade de uma determinada prática para aquela empresa, né? a ideia de nicho, é nisso que nós atuamos e não naquilo, de modo que nós devemos nos especializar, nós devemos nos aprofundar, nós devemos verticalizar naquilo em que a gente é bom. Quantos aqui nesse auditório provavelmente já não tiveram a ideia de um novo negócio e você foi levar uma empresa já existente ou um fundo de angel capital e a resposta educada né, que dão a você quando querem dizer não é basicamente o seguinte, olha, é muito interessante, mas esse não, esse, essa sua proposta não está no nosso nicho. Ela não faz parte do nosso core business. Ou seja, core como sinônimo de verticalização, compartimentalização, this is what we do, not the other thing. E do ponto de vista de países, amigos, essa ideia de talento, ela sempre foi aprendida de uma forma ou de outra, de acordo com as linhas mestras deixadas pelo grande economista britânico do começo do século XIX, o Davi Ricardo, que é a ideia de talento como vantagem comparativa. É alguma coisa que a natureza lhe deu, se as suas vantagens comparativas estão mais nos recursos naturais, ou por outro lado, na indústria, e se essa foi a trajetória econômica que seu país percorreu. Eu só vou relembrar isso rapidamente aqui, mas todos, eu acho, estão familiarizados com o exemplo que Ricardo dava, no sentido de que se o sol de Portugal, a terra de Portugal, a umidade de Portugal, a maneira pela qual as videiras crescem em Portugal, conduzem Portugal a produzir bom vinho, as vantagens comparativas de Portugal estão na produção de vinho, Portugal não tem que se meter em fazer tecidos ou locomotivas, pois essas não são suas vantagens comparativas. Por outro lado, se você é britânico, dado a característica do seu solo, do seu clima, da sua incidência solar, não lhe permite a produção de vinhos, é melhor que os britânicos se especializem em têxteis ou em locomotivas, pois essas são as suas vantagens comparativas. Não há que é ver essa transposição setorial na economia global, pois é apenas a troca entre vantagens comparativas em que cada um produz os seus, as suas excelências que estará a beleza e a prosperidade de todos. A minha impressão, meus amigos, é que nesse novo conceito de sustentabilidade que vem por aí, né, essas noções tradicionais de talento, especialização, vantagens comparativas, elas implodiram. Puf. Elas estão deixando de ser importantes. Vamos começar por um exemplo empresarial. Que, aliás, é uma empresa que tem um monte de pecados também. Alguém aqui conhece uma empresa chamada Samsung? Ou melhor, alguém aqui não conhece uma empresa chamada Samsung? É uma empresa que faz o quê? Bom, vocês podem dizer o seguinte, olha, é a empresa que mais vende linha branca no mundo, é uma empresa que vende mais smartphones do que a Apple, 
é uma empresa que faz satélites, é uma empresa que faz embarcações capazes de carregar grandes quantidades de petróleo do tipo Aframax, Panamax ou Suezmax. Né? Mas deixa agora questionar o conhecimento de vocês da língua coreana. O que quer dizer Samsung? Você sabe, John, o que Samsung means? Alguém aqui já lutou judô? Se alguém aqui já lutou judô, meu querido André, se alguém aqui já lutou judô, você se lembra que quando a gente conta de 1 a 10 em japonês, ichi ni san. A palavra 3 em japonês tem o mesmo som da palavra 3 em coreano. Samsung, Dr. Shell, significa três estrelas. Porque essa empresa, ela tinha três core businesses. Ela tinha três nichos. A vertente econômica da sua noção de sustentabilidade, que significa eu vou sobreviver nos negócios, era pautada por três especializações, três verticais. A exportação de frutas secas, a exportação de crustáceos, porque a costa né, da Coreia do Sul ela, ela é muito profunda e, e com água fria, né, o que é bom para o aparecimento de costas. E, mais importante do que tudo, né, a, o terceiro pilar da empresa, que durante, um, 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 sobretudo, o período que se seguiu, né, a Guerra Peninsular na Coreia, foi o que garantiu uma receita importante né, de, de, de moeda forte né, e, a, e a própria sobrevivência da empresa, a exportação de perucas. Né, durante a Guerra Coreana, literalmente, John, a Samsung rapou a cabeça dos meninos e meninos para fazer perucas e para vender para um grande comprador nos Estados Unidos chamado Macy's Corporation. É esse exemplo de metamorfose, esse exemplo de metamorfose do talento da Samsung está em linha, a meu ver, com o conceito de sustentabilidade que vem por aí. Nós poderíamos dar um monte de exemplos também do ponto de vista individual. Né? Por exemplo, na Londres do John nos anos 70 e nos anos 80, se você era um contador, não contador de história, não contador de contabilidade, você era um licensed legal accountant, né, nos anos 70, nos anos 80, aquilo era de um status social extraordinário. Né? Você dá um cartão para alguém, licensed legal accountant, era uma garantia quase que você poderia até arrumar uma namorada, né, do tamanho do seu prestígio. Com a utilização crescente de algumas dessas ferramentas tecnológicas descritas na apresentação do John, ou esse profissional ele migrou para o âmbito do planejamento tributário, da estratégia corporativa como um todo, ou então a sua profissão não é mais sustentável, porque ela foi substituída, substituída por uma série de programas baseados em algoritmos que repetem, modelam e preveem aquilo que ele fazia intelectual manualmente antes. É muito curioso, é como se... Vocês sabem que esses dias o Donald Trump teve na Confederação Nacional das Indústrias dos Estados Unidos, da American Association of Manufacturers. É como se essa expressão manufacture, manufatura, tivesse, juntamente com esse novo conceito de sustentabilidade, perdendo o seu sentido completo. Nós estamos saindo da manufatura, doutor Shelley, para a mente-fatura. É uma mudança extraordinariamente importante. Isso vai revolucionar dramaticamente todas as profissões, e algumas delas provavelmente serão extintas. Todas as profissões. Inclusive, a mais antiga das profissões. Esses dias eu fiz uma, uma palestra nos Estados Unidos e depois fui abordado por uma pessoa que me deu um cartão que, para, que dizia o seguinte, SRR, The Automation of Pleasure. <risos> Eu pensei, bom, seguramente ou é uma casa noturna, ou alguma outra, algum outro ramo dessa atividade. Né? Mas não a, a simpática, minha simpática interlocutora estava me dizendo, John, que SRR significa Sexually Responsive Robots. Não é isso? São robôs com os quais você pode interagir sexualmente. Então vejam, até a profissão mais antiga do mundo vai passar por uma metamorfose dramática nesses anos que vem. Por aí. Do ponto de vista dos países, meus amigos, é absolutamente a mesma coisa. Por exemplo, nós estamos acostumados com uma narrativa que também é muito baseada naquela velha ideia de que as economias só são sustentáveis se elas aproveitam as suas vantagens comparativas, né? 
de entender que porque a Ásia Pacífico está crescendo o mundo, há uma grande demanda mundial por alimentos uh, e por bens minerais, onde o Brasil, por exemplo, tem vantagens comparativas, o Brasil conseguiria garantir uma renda cativa nesses próximos 20, 25 anos, que viesse a permitir, por exemplo, investimentos em pesquisa, desenvolvimento e inovação. Né? Bom, outro dia, John, é, eu, eu, eu vou muito à China, né, tenho ido à China bastante, e eu estou absolutamente fascinado como em supermercados na China, e mesmo em restaurantes na China, você encontra pratos à base de peixes de rio brasileiros. E não é só Saint-Pierre, né, que na realidade é tilápia, mas também coisas como pintado, pacu, peixes de rio brasileiros. Bom, isso ficou muito na minha cabeça. Há alguns meses atrás, eu fui fazer uma palestra na cidade de Sorriso, no interior do Brasil, lá em Mato Grosso. Sorriso não tem aeroporto, você tem que descer em Sinop. Os organizadores mandaram um carro nos apanhar para nos levar para Sorriso. E aí veio junto comigo no carro o outro orador dessa conferência, um senhor que me deu um cartão com o nome dele e com a inscrição Associação Brasileira dos Criadores de Peixe de Rio. Ele criou até uma marca, Peixe BR. Eu falei, puxa, que interessante. Parabéns, parabéns. Que trabalho extraordinário vocês vêm fazendo, não apenas por conta das práticas sustentáveis de, 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 de produção, né? criação e produção, processamento de peixes de rio, mas também por esse fluxo, é, sem dúvida, volumoso né? de exportações ao principal mercado consumidor desse produto no mundo, que é a China, porque, olha, hoje, hoje se você jogar uma pedra para cima, cai num peixe brasileiro na China, cheio de peixe brasileiro. E aí começou um dia de extraordinária humilhação para mim, porque ele veio dizer o seguinte, Marcos, não é assim. Há 25 anos, um grupo de cientistas né, acadêmicos, no âmbito de uma, um acordo de cooperação Brasil-China, veio ao Brasil visitar diferentes ecossistemas de água de rio e recolheram praticamente amostras de todos os alevinos brasileiros. Piraputanga, Pintado, é, Matrixana, Pacu e levaram para a China. E com estratégia, com planejamento, e com um desenho de uma legislação ambiental que era amistosa ao meio ambiente, de água de rio, mas também amistoso à produção, os, chines, os chineses aumentaram mais e mais e mais a sua produção desse produto. Resultado, hoje, a China é a maior produtora mundial de peixes de rio brasileiros. E de uma maneira interessantíssima, quer dizer, eles não estão só preocupados em pegar o peixe, eles estão preocupados também fazendo extraordinárias joint ventures com os, os noruegueses, por exemplo, são os caras que mais entendem de peixe do mundo, para fazer produtos é, laminados, resfriados, defumados e tingidos, como o recém-lançado Red Paku, né? que é um produto que os chineses lançaram agora na feira de Boston, né? que é a maior desse setor no mundo, para competir com o mercado internacional de salmão. Então, vejam, mais uma vez, a ideia de criação de novos talentos, daquilo que o grande professor brasileiro Eugênio Moussac chama de metacompetência, como um critério importante da sustentabilidade. Agora, os principais desafios, meus amigos, a meu ver, fora esses maiores, né, de, de como é que nós vamos estrategizar como país, não é? Essa nova, esse novo conceito de sustentabilidade, que é muito intensivo em talento, é o que fazer no âmbito da nossa própria empresa, na relação capital-trabalho. Eu não sei se vocês já ouviram a, a imagem, piada, está ficando cada vez mais batida, mas eu vou contar mesmo assim, o John seguramente sabe, né? que é, nos pergunta um pouco como é que vai ser a indústria do futuro, a fábrica do futuro. Vai ser assim, doutor Marcos Guerra, na fábrica do futuro nós vamos ter as máquinas, um homem e um cachorro. Bom, as máquinas estão lá para produzir. O homem está lá para dar comida para o cachorro. 
e o cachorro está lá para evitar que o homem encoste nas máquinas. Porque vejam que coisa curiosa. Talvez um dos principais desafios, eu diria que ao lado de algumas das questões ambientais levantadas aqui, talvez o principal desafio desses, nossos próximos, desses próximos 25 anos em termos de sustentabilidade é esse brutal divórcio, brutal divórcio entre a geração de valor e a geração de trabalho. Antigamente, você ia numa, numa agência do Bradesco, numa praça central, trabalhava ali 250 funcionários. Hoje, vocês têm, hoje você tem hedge funds que administram algumas centenas de bilhões de dólares e eles são compostos por 12 pessoas. O agronegócio, né, que sem dúvida alguma é uma das grandes é, orgulhos do Brasil, é cada vez menos intensiva, cada vez menos intensivo em força de trabalho. E por que, que esse é um desafio tão grande para o conceito de sustentabilidade? John. Porque vejam que coisa curiosa. Quando o velho Marx, quando o velho Marx escreveu O Capital, metade do século XIX, o país mais desenvolvido do mundo era a Inglaterra. E a expectativa média de vida ao nascer no país mais desenvolvido do mundo, que era a Inglaterra, era de 39 anos de idade. Por quê? O cara começava a trabalhar com 6, 7 anos, em torno de 14 horas por dia, 6 dias por semana, aos 38, 39 anos, ele batia as botas. Hoje, mesmo num país como o Brasil, que é um país de renda média, a expectativa média de vida ao nascer das mulheres está muito próximo de 80 anos, e, do, e dos homens já ultrapassou 75 anos. Eu tenho certeza que muitos nessa sala aqui leram aquele best-seller de alta vulgarização chamado Outliers, do Malcolm Gladwell, não é isso? Em que ele tenta identificar o DNA do êxito como sinônimo da capacidade de absorção de 10 mil horas de foco, não só educação ou prática, as duas coisas juntas, foco, para que você possa desempenhar uma determinada habilidade humana. Agora, o que acontece com uma pessoa que chega aos 25 anos de idade, não sem ter as 10 mil horas, mas você tem, sem ter mil horas, o que, que vai acontecer com a vida dela, do ponto de vista da sustentabilidade dela própria, da sua empresa, do ambiente em que ela se insere? Que ela se insere? Porque nós não estamos na Inglaterra do final do século, da metade do século XIX. Isso quer dizer o seguinte, se ela chegar aos 25 anos de idade, sem ter os equipamentos mínimos, intelectuais, para desempenhar uma função desse mundo do que nós estamos descrevendo, o que será que ela vai fazer com a existência dela dos 25 até os 80 anos? O que, que isso vai significar, por exemplo, em termos de orçamento público, seja para a segurança das grandes cidades, seja para a gestão de águas urbanas, seja para seguro-desemprego, porque essa pessoa será muito pouco útil, será muito pouco sustentável para essas pontas de lança da quarta revolução industrial, mas será extraordinariamente, será extraordinariamente instrumental para negócios como o tráfico de entorpecentes, o comércio ilegal de armas e a pirataria. Não é nenhuma surpresa, John, que hoje numa cidade como São Paulo, na grande São Paulo, de cada cinco jovens de até 25 anos de idade, um, 20%, é do tipo nem, nem, nem. Nem trabalha, nem estuda e nem está procurando emprego. E minha impressão é de que, como o Warren Buffett diz que quando você tem uma crise, né, quem estava nadando quem estava nadando sem calção na praia, né, a maré baixa, você vê quem é que estava nu. Minha impressão é que, nessa transição brasileira, na minha opinião, dos próximos 18 meses, para uma situação macroeconômica melhor, muitos desses 14 milhões de desempregados vão ser reinseridos no mercado de trabalho por razões conjunturais. Melhor investimento, melhores perspectivas, melhora crédito, as pessoas voltam ao mercado de trabalho. Mas muitas delas, muitas delas simplesmente 
não conseguirão se reinserir em atividades econômicas porque elas não detêm os requisitos mínimos para desempenhar uma posição produtiva nesse novo mundo que vem por aí. Então, a minha última mensagem é basicamente o seguinte. Não abandonemos, pelo contrário, reforcemos os dutos ecológicos do conceito de sustentabilidade. Mas, do ponto de vista dos dutos econômicos do conceito de sustentabilidade, talvez a palavra mais importante, aliás, se vocês não se lembrarem de nada do que eu disse aqui, lembrem-se, pelo menos, do que eu vou dizer agora, a palavra mais importante para essa nova sustentabilidade que vem por aí é a palavra reskilling. Recapacitação, reabilitação, retreinamento. Daqueles que podem desempenhar um papel produtivo nesse mundo que vem por aí. Algumas habilidades vão se perder, elas vão ser recapacitadas. People have to be reskilled. Essa é a palavra mais importante nas próximas duas décadas mais importante, sobretudo no nosso contexto específico brasileiro, onde nós temos tanta criatividade desperdiçada. Se nós não conseguirmos fazer isso, minha impressão é que, mais uma vez, não importando quão corretas estejam as nossas, os nossos paradigmas de sustentabilidade, países como o Brasil vão continuar em trajetórias semelhantes a voos de galinha. Por outro lado, se a gente conseguir fazer isso, conseguir fazer isso, nós vamos dar plena expressão à criatividade que nós temos tão vibrante no Brasil. E, seguramente, o nosso país, também no setor industrial, vai poder ser uma das economias mais dinâmicas do século XXI. Obrigado. Muito obrigada, senhor Marcos. Informamos que faremos um intervalo para o almoço e retornaremos a este auditório a partir das 14 horas. O brante aos participantes será servido na área externa do auditório. Até mais tarde. Vai ter o debate? Há um minutinho, por favor, então. Antes de sairmos para o almoço, vai haver um rápido debate. Estavam gostando já, né? Mr. John, please. A gente, a gente vai mudar para o inglês, né, por, orienta, por orientação da, dos organizadores. Né. So John, jobless future. How will futures be created? How will jobs be created in the future? How can we overcome some of the obstacles that both uh, you and I described in our talks? I don't know. Is the first answer because. I think we are facing a fascinating, really challenging period in our collective history. And I look back, for example, at the, print, the discovery of the printing press, and we now look at it as a safe technology, and we learned a huge amount from reading books. But if you look back at the dynamics of the history that, and the politics that the printing press created, it gave us about 100 years worth of religious wars huge great controversies tore uh, societies apart. The internet is in the process of doing something rather similar. And so, you know, we may go through it much faster, um, but I, I, I don't think we are simply facing a straightforward trajectory from a nice internet to a wonderful new world that is completely sustainable, where young people and others have the jobs that they would uh, want, even if we reskill them. And when you asked uh, Marcos earlier on the audience to put up their hands and say, what do you think the three big challenges are? The one that came to my mind was the need to build better bridges between young people and old people. 
because I think there is a tension building in some societies. We saw it in my country with Brexit, where the old people voted for Brexit, and the young people are horrified at what's being done with their future. So I think there's a real tension there. I think most of the jobs will be doing things we've never heard of, maybe maintaining the sexually responsive robots or whatever. Uh, oh God, I hope not. Um, but most of these things will be invented by people we've never heard of. So <laughs> my fingers are crossed. Mine as, mine as well. But uh, one of the things that I mean really caught my attention in your presentation, John, was uh, you said incremental sustainability is perhaps gone, or it should be gone. Why, why do you say that? I mean, why isn't there, especially in countries like uh, the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, and China, a st still a long way to go for, uh, for awareness, for incremental sustainability? I, I want to... I want to come back to you in a moment, Marcos, because I think uh, you, you said something about China, which I think really resonated with me, a country that has succeeded, that has grown to almost miraculous degree, but without the rule of law, without democracy very often as we would understand it, and without a great deal of respect for the wider environment. I'd love to have your sense of, of where you think uh, that might be going. Let me say a little bit about incrementalism. I do not mean that ordinary people should not do small steps, whatever they can, whatever's within their power to do. That's important. And very often that's the entry level. So if you have people in my country at the moment, people are fighting in, in an old industrial city, Sheffield, to protect urban trees, trees in cities. Because the council, to save money, is cutting the trees down. And people are now going around trying to put a value on those trees. Now, I think those local politics are incredibly important. And I think what people do in small ways is also incredibly important. All I'm saying is, if that's all we do, the changes that you're talking about, the changes that we are increasingly seeing, uh, bless you, um, are coming at us at such speed and at such scale it doesn't matter what happens at the ground level. So it's not either or, as it, we'd say, both and. But I'd love to come back to the China point because I'm, I've worked there and I love the Chinese, uh, what I've seen of them, but they also frighten the, white, the, 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 the life out of me because I think they are coming at such speed and with such a strange sense of history that I think whatever they say about peaceful rise, we may find ourselves at war sooner than we might imagine, and their democracy, legal, and environmental values look different. Now, I'm sure you're an optimist, and I'm looking forward to hearing your optimism. You know, I'm only optimist in the sense that I think there is so much inter interdependence in the world now, especially when you think about the two members of the G2, China and the United States. I mean. Uh, China is, 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 is America's uh, top destination for foreign direct investment, vice versa. The uh, bilateral commercial exchange between China and the U.S. is, is bigger than the, um, than, than the trade uh, flows between China and all of the other BRICs. So I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of interdependence there. But I mean, uh, of course, humans make mistakes. People in power makes mistakes. I just don't think that this is happening anytime soon. It may, it may be projected into the future, especially because, as we were discussing yesterday, China is still a very small player when compared to the United States in defense spending, for example, and, and it, it really has to gear up militarily to play, to play a role there. But that, John, bringing the, the discussion back to, to sustainability, which, which I think is, is, is really undergoing this metamorphosis that, uh, that we described in our, in our talks, uh, we now uh, talk about uh, things like the Amazon and, and, and the extraordinary biodiversity it has. It's a great environmental asset that Brazil does not take, say, full advantage of in terms of developing tech-intensive products from originating from that uh, ecosystem. Do you have any advice on those who want to make, for example, biodiversity a profitable business and therefore exploring these huge advantages that a country like Brazil has? Again, that's a very difficult question, but let me try. Um, I think uh, I mentioned Fibria, Brazilian forestry products company, used to be a pulp company, now exploring different models. 
business models. And they're looking at simple things like lignin, but a bunch of other uh, forest products, including system services over time. And you know, increasingly people talk about ecosystem services, that intact, healthy ecosystems do things like flood control, carbon absorption, which we currently don't uh, value. And I, th I think biodiversity is both incredibly important and even for someone like me, at risk of being quite boring, in the sense I love being in nature, uh, I really do. Uh, it's where I started my uh, career in a way. But for most people in business, if you start to talk about biodiversity, they'll put, push you through to their, you know, uh, their, their parks conservation department or whatever. It, it's not yet established in the way that it should be in boards and C-suite discussions. And so one of the things that we've been doing in recent years is working into the space of what is called biomimicry. What can we learn at the level of a material or a product or a process or an organization or an economy or whatever from nature? How does nature do these things? So you referenced the uh, circular economy, Marcos, and I think that is an example of looking at nature and learning from how nature does things. And I've worked with Janine Benyus in the United States for five or six years. She has the Biomimicry Institute. And we, we've all heard the stories about where did Velcro, for example, I don't know what it would be in Portuguese. Is it the same Velcro. brand? Same. Okay. Um, where did that come from? Well, it came from a thistle, you know, a seed, a thistle catching in a dog's uh, fur, not the same dog that was in the robotic uh, uh, factory, but um, you know, there, there is so much we can learn there. But I think if we simply go at people through biodiversity and you should do the right thing, we're not going to capture their attention. So two things. I think we've got to come from innovation and what we can learn from nature, so biomimicry, and also over time, governments are going to, despite what I said about national governments not yet being terribly effective in this space, they have to start pricing resources. Pricing carbon, pricing water, it's very political, but they have to do it, and they're gonna to have to price uh, exports, for example, of biodiversity used by biotech, biotechnology companies and so on. I don't have a simple uh, solution to all of this. It's gonna take ages to sort this out, but if we simply try and preach biodiversity to people, we won't connect, I don't think. Very good. Well, John, there are so many questions here addressed to you. One is coming from Sergio Monforti. Uh, I just want to uh, tell everyone that there's this app. You can forward questions to both uh, John and myself through the app. Uh, Sergio Monforti is, is, is referring to uh, your presentation when you said, well, do I trust big, big companies? I do not. Do I trust multinational corporations? I don't. How do, you, how do you go around or how do you solve the problem of trust in contemporary societies? And why is that so important if we're thinking about new ways of approaching sustainability? Well, thank you for the question. Let me start with a slightly playful answer and then I'll become serious, if I may. Um, younger colleagues have often asked me, how do you go into a company, into an organization, into a boardroom, and know whether or not you can trust the people that you're meeting? And I sometimes describe the process. I once described this in China. It's like going into a museum or an art gallery and seeing a Ming vase and taking your finger and flicking the vase. At that point, I, I had lost half my audience in China. But the, but the point was, if, if you get a dull thud, dunk, you know that there's very little integrity there. But if you get a ringing sound, the vase is whole. Now, that may seem a complicated uh, story, but the way that I've done it in the past is you see whether there is humor in the room. And that's why I say it's playful. And if you get people being not just dead serious right from the start, but being a little bit playful around these issues, you know that they have the capacity to engage even quite complex um, agenda items. And, and, and as a bridge to becoming serious, Many years ago, when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, Walmart lost over 100 stores overnight. And so as many of you will know, they started to put intense pressure on their supply chains. And within about four or five months, 
I was in the boardrooms of two of their really big suppliers, DuPont and 3M, both com countries with fantastic histories of dealing with safety, health, environment, quality, and so on. And I think it was the 3M meeting in Minnesota. And at the end of the board meeting, a woman came up to me and said, why do you use humor when you're engaging a board? Why do you do that? And I thought, oh my God, here we're going to go. I'm going to get beaten up. But she turned out to be a psychologist. And she said something that's always r remained in my memory. She said, when you do that and you're coming from the outside and you're representing a sustainability agenda, you too are showing that you're, you can be playful with your own agenda. You're not a complete missionary. But second, she said, you're also dealing with people who are not used to it, their own people or people from the outside coming in and playing with them. That's peculiar. And they say that they, there's an assumption, a hu very human assumption. If he can play with us, he must have a very big army outside. <laughs> and so I, I, I think this, um, this question of, 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 of playfulness and humor, I don't recommend it to everyone, but I think it's a key part uh, of this story. And then we have to be dead serious because this agenda is increasingly serious. And I think whether we talk about climate change or the other issues that come with it, we face a very challenging uh, future. And I just go back to the, um, the young people issue. I have every confidence, and I'd love Marcus to ask, because you teach to some degree in, 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 in your work, you interact with young people uh, from around the world. I've just seen a study and in a way I sort of referenced it a moment ago, where young people are increasingly pessimistic about the future, about having equal living standards to their parents, about our capacity to uh, control uh, runaway climate change and whatever. And I just wonder, in the work that you do uh, with younger people from around this planet, what trends do you see there? You're seeing a very particular slice, because you're seeing very intelligent people who are in you know, dedicated to improving their own lives and learning, so that, you know, it's a subset. What are you seeing? It, it's interesting, John, because I think the, the overall profile of, uh, of young people, to a certain degree, uh, are, are, are designed in line with the overall sentiment that a country exudes to the rest of the world. Of course, in countries like China and India, so many people moving up the, uh, the, the social ladder, people becoming wealthier. There's great confidence in the future, not an obstacle, not an obstacle that cannot be overcome. But in, uh, but in countries like Russia, where, where I do go to a lot, there's, there's that idea that the past is better than the present and that in all likelihood the future is not gonna be as good as the present. And, and, you, hear, and you hear other people in Russia saying, uh, when, I was, when I was younger, my idea was to build the socialist motherland. Today, my kids' idea are to emigrate either to London or to New York and, and, and wear jeans and, 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 and look like top models. That's their objective in life. And to a certain extent, I think there is a strong connection between that sort of, uh, that sort of outlook and what's happening also on the ground in in, in economic terms, because many of many uh, important slices of these populations simply will not find jobs in 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 in, in the new economy that's emerging, and that is going to create very very strong difficulties for those, for example, who think about industrial policy. Uh, one, I think, of the chief characteristics we have at a house like C Confederação Nacional da Indústria, the uh, the CNI here in Brazil, is how can you reconcile? some of the parameters that, are, that have been adopted by the international community with, a, with an industrial policy that, like it or not, has to be aimed at, uh, at competitiveness. Right? Industrial policy up until now is whether, is, is, was deciding whether you go for import substitution, whether you increase local content policies as part of your overall uh, legislative uh, infrastructure. That has changed. That has changed dramatically. And I think one of the, uh, one of the most important uh, uh, society, uh, societal sectors that are that are going to be impacted are younger people because uh, even if you t think about the way demographics is progressing in the world today, uh, life expectancy at birth, for example, in countries like Brazil, are only going to go up, right? This is even going to create, I think, 
linguistic problems. Uh, in Switzerland, for example, two out of, one out of two kids that are born today are going to leave north the age of 100, right? In, 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 in Brazil, people are, are, are becoming, uh, are living to a, to, a, to a more mature age. So if it takes so long for you to prepare your competitive entry into the marketplace, into the labor market, where exactly do your teenage years um, end? Because we have gotten used to, for example, when you talk about the notion of, of, of a teenager is, is, is equal to the numbers in English from 13 to 19, 13, 14, that's, that's why you become a teenager. But you have to have, if you have to have so many skills to be, once again, competitive in this age that we're walking into, when is your teenage years going to become? It's probably good news for some because they may feel like they're teenagers up until the age of 35 or 40. So uh, this, is a, this is a very important, uh, this is a very important impact that we're gonna uh, feel in Brazil and, and, and across the world. And of course, it's a much bigger challenge in the sense that, as, as I've mentioned in my, in my talk, my impression is that perhaps with the exception of sectors like tourism, which is still very labor intensive, we are, we're only gonna see more of a, of a brutal divorce between the creation of value and the creation of jobs. And when we talk about talentism, a great theme, your, your third bullet point in a way, um, most people, most of the time, will think about young people. But I mentioned in some countries the aging trajectory where you know reskilling is not just going to be giving younger people the capacity to reskill but taking older people and, and and when i think about business and i think the people who typically are given the responsibility for dealing with skills and training and these sort of factors it's human resources people and i don't know what the situation is like uh, in brazil but very often in the wider world until very recently the human resources people were one of the biggest barriers to the sort of change that we've been talking about today. And I don't totally understand why. In some countries, I think it's because of the union history. You know, social change came from people we didn't, if we were in business, terribly like, and therefore we sort of held it out and it was a problem. Uh, that might be part of the story. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, we, we, and, and when we talk about sustainability, of course, we place so much emphasis on, on the environmental aspects of the ecosystem. But I was going to ask you, John, how about the institutional ecosystem? How, about, how important do you see institutions as, as the framework within which people and companies can find a place under the sun in this new scenario that we were describing today? Well, again, just to go back to something you said about China and the democracy, the legal, the institutional, the, you know, the environmental uh, p p parts of that story, I think the institutional piece is critical. And whatever China has managed to do in, in you know, a relatively short period of time, a lot of that comes from a very difficult history, the Cultural Revolution and so on. And it's extraordinary what they've achieved. But if you take those values and you take those politics, and you take you know, that lack of concern for the wider environment, although I do think that concern is beginning to build, particularly in the eastern seaboard cities with air quality issues, people seeing problems like asthma in, 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 in their children, you know, uh, children having to sort of uh, have their schools shut down because of uh, pollution problems. It's beginning, but I think institutions are crucial. And we've had here, for example, representatives of the United Nations. I think the United Nations is fantastic as far as it goes, but it really doesn't go nearly far enough. It's a construct, a product, of a period in the 1930s and 1940s where the world tore itself apart. And we sacrificed a limited amount of sovereignty uh, to allow better things to happen uh, around the planet. Somehow, I think we're going to have to reinvent the United Nations and a whole raft of globalization, uh, global uh, governance um, institutions and processes around that. And I, sh I imagine that must be a key part of the work that you do on the BRICS and yeah. beyond. It is, it is, it is. And, and when you mentioned the United Gen Nations, John, and perhaps the need to reboot it, I think, I mean, I was posted there for five years in the 1990s and it hurt me very much to see that, for example, 
uh, the United Nations can only be what uh, nations want it to be. It can only, it's, it's a club of countries. Uh, it, it can only be as effective as, as countries allow it to be. Uh, uh, as I was mentioning, it was, I was very sorry to see, for example, that the United Nations budget for yearly operations is uh, smaller than that of the New York Fire Department, right? And of course, the fires that... Uh, the fires that the United Nations has to extinguish are perhaps much more complicated because they are geopolitical, they are environmental, they are uh, development related in, in nature rather than those only of the, of the New York Fire Department. But I don't see a lot of appetite for that. I mean, you mentioned in your um, talk the sort of more fragmented order that we are walking into with Brexit, with, with, with Trump, with the United States moving away from a leadership uh, position countries becoming very individualistic. Uh, I think there was a gentleman here that said that one of the features that we see in today's world is nationalism. I see individual, I see, I see national individualism, but not necessarily, for example, when Trump says America first, he welcomes foreign direct investment. He wants things to be manufactured, produced within American borders, not necessarily coming from American capital origins. So do you really, do you really see the United Nations reinvention as something that is both foreseeable and feasible? Not, sorry, not in short order. I think um, it is what it is. We work with various parts of the UN, including the Global Compact. There are wonderful people trying to do their best, but I don't think uh, it's really pushing the needle in the way that we would imagine it uh, needs to be done. And several people here this morning talked to me about particular CEOs, business leaders who are now trying to address that problem, step into the gap, including particularly uh, Paul Pullman of Unilever, mentioned a couple of times, fantastic, you know, St. Paul, uh, uh, wonderful guy, I, I, I love him to pieces, but we can't rely on just a few individual leaders like that. And I, I'd love to ask you a question around the role of organizations like CNI, business to business platforms, because I think if I look back at my personal history, those sorts of confederations and associations and so on have been a screaming nightmare in deep history. I mean, they always tried to get in the way of change, but now it's changing. And I think some of these uh, organizations, and I was very interested to hear about what CNI is doing, are beginning to say, the change is coming, our members are going to have to adapt. How can we help them uh, do that? And there's competitive pressure where new platforms are springing up. But how do you see that uh, developing, and in the BRICS yeah. in particular? Yeah, no, it's a very interesting point, John, because, you know, I've studied how countries like uh, Brazil or China have uh, strategized in order to achieve economic development. And, and when you look, for example, at Brazil's model from after World War II all the way to very recently, it was mostly about import substitution. It was mostly about uh, putting the domestic market first. It was mostly about protection. It was about uh, we, we, we are a big population country. We, we have to make sure that this consumer market belongs to us. But if, if history teaches us a lesson in this past seven years is that those countries that have organized their industrial policies to the conquest of, of foreign markets have fared much better. It's the case of China. It's the case of Chile. It's the case of, of South Korea. Uh, whereas those countries that have maintained uh, positions conservative and only looking inside uh, their own domestic realities, they have fared much worse. It's the case of Turkey, it's the case of Argentina, and unfortunately it's also the case of Brazil. And in years past, whenever you would speak to uh, institutions like the Federation of Industries of the State of Sao Paulo, which was very powerful, or CNI, it was basically a bedrock of economic isolationism, but not anymore. I think some of the most advanced discussions and, 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 and draft policies that are being worked in, the, in, in Brazil today to allow for the country's reinsertion into the global economy for exports and imports to play uh, a, a bigger role in, in the organic composition of our GDP are coming from institutions like CNI. You take the environmental issue or sustainability, it's, 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 it's late technology thinking that's being originated from a federation, from a, from, from a confederation like this. So more of a constructive role than an obstructive role uh, when, when you think about CNI. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's not a cheap compliment. I think it's, a, it's really an observation of reality on the ground. 
Well, it, 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 that has to be the future. I mean, we promised people lunch, and then we st stole it. Um, but I, if, if I might, I just wanted to explore one uh, issue, and it perhaps gives a little bit of the background to when I was talking about that incrementalism to system change uh, agenda that we see evolving. I said last night at dinner that the one industry that I think needs massive disruption, and in fact, if I could blow, you know, press the plunger on the dynamite and blow it up, I probably would, it's the sustainability industry. Because I don't think it's fit for purpose. I think it's grown up in a very different reality. I think it's grown up to um, encourage people to, you know, as I said earlier on, to do the citizenship and corporate social responsibility piece. But most of the people in most companies that we deal with who deal with the sustainability agenda, including chief sustainability officers, if you ask them to draw the business model of their organization on the back of a napkin or an envelope, they really struggle. Now, maybe that's because they work for very complex organizations with multiple business models, but I think it's something else. I think they come from a very different uh, background. And if we're going to drive the right sort of change, not incremental only, but, but increasingly systemic change, including the institutional evolution that we will need uh, to see, then I think we need to pull very different people into this industry, whatever we then call it. And just to go very quickly back to your biodiversity um, point, I think a lot of the language that we use is really important that we understand biodiversity and the science that goes with it and the economics uh, and so on. But over time, I think we've got to change our language, we've got to change the way we engage with the wider world, and we've got to suck in a very different generation of, of talent. Some of those people will be young, some of them will be older, but it's that, I think, in the next three to five years, we're gonna see a level of change in the so-called sustainability industry, which again is absolutely off the scale, and I think it's overdue. Well, John, you know, they say that uh, there's no such thing as a free lunch, but maybe we have earned ours, and, you know, humans are only sustainable if they eat, so let us uh, invite everyone for lunch. Hope this was productive. Thank you very much. See you soon. Thank you. Obrigado.